welcome to the press room. I'm Kirby Jackson, and we have a very interesting program for you this evening. With the passage of the Drug Prevention of Misuse Amendment Act in 2019, the medicinal marijuana industry and all connected to it began to be rolled out. The latest rollout is the recently opened Greenhouse Cafe. Tonight in the press room, we take a look at the blossoming industry as we address cannabis confusion, clearing the smoke on the marijuana usage issue. Joining us tonight, we have the Honorable Minister of Agriculture, Mr. Saboto Caesar, and former government minister and parliamentary representative, and the, the distinguished CEO of the Medicinal Cannabis Authority, Dr. Gerald Thompson. Remember, join us on our YouTube, the Facebook YouTube channel and Facebook page. Like it, share it. And when we come back, we're going to be joined by Minister Caesar and Dr. Thompson as we dive into cannabis confusion, clearing the smoke on the marijuana usage issue. We'll be right back. <music> Welcome back. I got my COVID-19 vaccine and my booster shot to ensure that I am protected. I've never been tested positive for COVID-19. And even if I did contract the virus, I've never been sick. And I'm confident that the COVID-19 vaccine significantly contributed to that. The vaccines are safe, they are effective, and they're one of the ways that we can navigate this pandemic together. If you've not yet considered vaccination or getting your booster shot, I encourage you to do so today. Get vaccinated. Well, welcome back in the press room. And again, feel free to join us on our YouTube channel and our Facebook page. Like and share. We have a very interesting program tonight. We have the, the Honorable... Minister of Agriculture, Minister Caesar. Good to have you, sir. It's a pleasant night to you. Definitely an honor and a privilege to be here to discuss such a topical and important subject matter. Yes. And, of course, the man who has the, the, the heavy crown of being the CEO of, of the Medicinal Cannabis Authority, uh, Dr. Thompson. Good to have you, sir, on the program. Certainly a pleasure. It's certainly a pleasure being here this evening. Right. And I want to tell those of who are joining us and, and taking in the program, feel free to send your questions in. And in the last segment, we will ask the goodly gentlemen some of your questions um, that are burning on your own hearts on the issue. Let me first start by asking you, gentlemen, uh, Minister Caesar, Dr. Thompson, in your time on this earth and in Blessed St. Vincent and the Grenadines, did you ever th think or imagine that you would be on a program discussing a legal marijuana industry? Well, you know, it's it's always one of the 
the softer parts of the conversation whenever we are in public discussing cannabis. And I remember quite recently at the, the Cannabis Authority, there was Spirit Cuttle, about five other traditional cultivators. And I said openly that 10 years ago, if it was heard that a minister of government was with Spirit Cuttle and five other traditional cultivators <laughs> out in a mushy area, and they were discussing cannabis, that it would have been a headliner in every newspaper in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. <laughs> but we have come a long way, and we are here to discuss the journey, um, the distance that we have traversed, where we are now, and where we intend to go. Good. What about you, Dr. Thompson? Well, I'm going to surprise you. Um, as a medical doctor, in 1990, I wrote my first letter or prescription for an HIV patient to receive cannabis in New York so that they could put on weight. And in 1995, this is 20, probably seven years ago, I would have learned a lot about this new system they discovered in our bodies called the endocannabinoid system. But it was 1997 that I attended a meeting with Spirit Cottle and others in Rosebank, uh, some cannabis revival, and they said they were going to the financial complex. And Gerald Thompson went to the financial complex with a placard saying that we need a Marshall Plan. Reporters came to me, actually, and it was published on, I think, either the front page or page three of the nation's newspaper that a prospective candidate for the Unity Labour Party was there congregating and conversing with um, traditional cultivators, not 10 years ago, but 20-something years ago outside the financial complex. So that is my dubious distinction. And yes, I, I, I would have envisioned over the years that this day would have come, and I'm glad that it has come. And, and I'm glad you said that. So now that you have the, the mantle of being the CEO of the Medicinal Cannabis Authority, the MCA, and as things have begun to roll out, what has been in your mind the most difficult aspect of rolling out this vision and this industry from your standpoint? I, I, I think that even though public opinion has changed substantially from the 90s and before. I think there is still something of uh, something of a wrong perception of what is required in order to create an industry. It's been tough, it's been challenging, and I don't think enough people understand a lot about these international treaties and the International Narcotic Control Board and the U United Nations and all these other entities that have brought about these treaties and, and all these sort of things, rules and regulations of how an industry, a medicinal cannabis industry can and must be rolled out. And I don't think they understand often that we have to follow these treaties, just like how we have to follow how whaling is done or human trafficking is done and all those sort of things. We have to follow these particular rules so that we could stay compliant with these international rules. So it's fair to say that has been the most difficult aspect of the, the journey thus far? I think there are lots of challenges, but for me, I think that in terms of trying to explain to persons that we more or less have to do it this way. They, they often think, look, there should be a simple process of just kicking the door down and getting it done. Let's do what we want. We're a sovereign nation. Let's do what we want. But they don't realize that internationally, just like you can't go and dump chemicals in the ocean and you can't go and, you know, harvest more than four whales here and say we harvest more than four whales or we, or we can't go and do a whole set of things internationally with drug, with drugs, cocaine, and so forth, that we have to follow these particular rules. I think that's been tough trying to explain things that way 
and, and, and finding the solutions around those issues. Granted. And even as you, well, I, I'm seeing we, we, lost, right, we, we have um, Minister Caesar back. Uh, from your perspective as Minister of Agriculture, um, dealing with it from the, as you say, from the ground, as it were, um, what has been the most difficult challenge for you? Well, well, first of all, I want to traverse the journey because before being a, a minister, I'm a human being. Yeah. And uh, I grew up in a community where there were users of cannabis and also cultivators of cannabis. And as you noted earlier, I had a previous career as a prosecutor. So on a, a Monday morning in court, I remember um, Jiggy Jiggy. I used to have a busy morning in court after Jiggy Jiggy where scores of young persons were arrested and brought before the court. And some of them were actually in the final stages of college or in secondary school. And they will get a, a record. And you know, getting a record in a small island means that you are locked out of employment in, in many different areas. And if you wanted to get a, a visa somewhere and you, there's a need for a recommendation that these things basically acted against you. Now, we have come an extremely long way. And in the entire Caribbean, in CARICOM, St. Vincent and Jamaica, St. Vincent and the Grenadines and Jamaica, we are definitely the leaders as it pertains to or participation in this fresh trajectory that has been taken on as it touches and concerns cannabis. Now, in order to answer that question, I have to first of all place the context in which we have approached cannabis in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And I want to state this, it is the policy of the government. It is our quest to establish a modern medicinal cannabis industry. Mm -hmm. And if we use that as the point of departure, that the political will enshrined in the conversation was particularized around issues touching and concerning cannabis for medicinal purposes and the scientific research and development. And why did we choose this path? We chose this path because in international law, it stipulates and specifies that cannabis should only be used for medicinal purposes or scientific research and development. And that if it was to be used for religious purposes, that a reservation to the international treaties would have to be made and there is a particular legal course to do this mm -hmm. what i must what i must add as well and gerald will support this in later on in the conversation is that the international narcotics control board which is basically the world narcotics police they have said that sending persons to prison or arresting persons and giving them a criminal record for very small quantities of cannabis, that that is an outdated practice. So even though Kirby, the law stipulates in international law, and we have signed on to these treaties, that cannabis must only be used for medicinal purposes and scientific research and development, we have seen through the practice that the police, the international police themselves are saying, well, whilst those are very too tight units. We understand that there will be persons who will be found in possession of very small quantities. And we really don't think in practice, even though the law is the law and it's not changed, that these persons are better off having a record. So in our drafting of the laws in St. Vincent and the Grenades, we took that into consideration. And the whole issue and scope of tolerance which is applied if someone is found with a very small quantity, 
is basically exhibited in the country. And we also recognize that persons who are found with these small quantities, they are not arrested, they are not charged, and we have enshrined a system for the depenalization of cannabis, not legalization, not decriminalization, but depenalization for very small quantities. I, I'm glad you raised that. Um, what would you say to the person who says to you that we're just playing with words or navigating, uh, you know, the, the course? Um, but really, um, it comes right back down to decriminalization of, of marijuana usage. Right. So I am really happy that you have asked the question and you have coached it that way. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, I want persons after listening to this program to have a very clear understanding and appreciation. And in any country, Kirby, there are local laws. Laws which come from the court system, laws which come from the parliament of the country, and the rules and regulations which are indigenous, they are homegrown, mm -hmm. and they are from our jurisdiction. But St. Vincent and the Grenadines is not a world unto itself. We are part of a global sphere, and we are part of the United Nations. And because we are part of the United Nations, we have signed on to some international treaties which we are governed by. And not only St. Vincent and the Grenadines, but all the countries of the world are governed by these treaties. As a small nation state with many challenges to address, the last challenge you would want is that the government does something that will impact the banking system in a negative way so that persons who want to bring their monies in by Western Union or MoneyGram or have a wire transfer, that they are stopped or they are affected. We have to respect the rights of everyone. And being a policymaker, one of our duties is to ensure that we balance things and that there is equilibrium in the discussion. So before us, we had several options. Option number one was to legalize cannabis. Everybody be allowed to grow cannabis in their backyards. Persons be allowed to smoke cannabis in different places, wherever they choose to, and have an unregulated system. That was an option. Option number two was to look at what all of the laws are saying and just for persons who are listening, we chose option number two. Because at the end of the day, we did not want to offend neither local law nor international law, but we wanted to participate in this emerging industry. So what we did was that we created a legal framework for persons with ailments, and there's a long list of ailments, to visit a doctor, a medical doctor, and be treated for cannabis, with cannabis, sorry. And not only to be treated with cannabis, but if there's a scientist anywhere in the world who wants to come and research cannabis, they can come to St. Vincent and research cannabis. And then we looked at the customs which have developed and the recordings from the Narcotics Police, the International Narcotics Control Board, and in their narrative, they were saying not to arrest persons for very small quantities. So we have adopted a ticketing system for persons who are found with very small quantities. And we have stated clearly that we recognize, we recognize the Rastafari community and faith in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And we are cognizant that cannabis is seen as a sacrament within the cannabis faith, and that persons who are utilizing cannabis as a sacrament, that there will be tolerance for this. And this is something that we are aware of, that even though one can take a reservation to the United Nations, that 
once the, the systems are in place to manage traceability, to manage non-diversion into the illicit market, that this can be tolerated whereby cannabis is used as a sacrament. Because I'm certain that the International Narcotics Control Board would see it as not a best practice if there are persons who within a particular situation are utilizing cannabis for religious purposes. But again, there is a legal pathway to make that, that happen whereby you remove it from tolerance and there is a law that can be applied. All right. Thank you so much. So we will be right back in the press room. We're going to have some messages. Remember, you can join us on our share or YouTube and Facebook, like it, and put your questions in. And in the very last segment, we'll try to answer as many of your questions as we can. We'll be right back with Minister Caesar and Dr. Thompson. I got my COVID-19 vaccine and my booster shot to ensure that I am protected. I've never been tested positive for COVID-19. And even if I did contract the virus, I've never been sick. And I'm confident that the COVID-19 vaccine significantly contributed to that. The vaccines are safe, they are effective, and they're one of the ways that we can navigate this pandemic together. If you've not yet considered vaccination or getting your booster shot, I encourage you to do so today. Get vaccinated. Searchlight Online, now stronger and better. And with more options for everyone, download the free app and access the e-paper and breaking news. Check out our e-papers, read aloud and translation features. Read our e-paper in different formats, even when you are offline. Access our online archive as far back as 2005. Only interested in viewing ads? Go directly to our print ad marketplace. Subscribers get exclusive access to a full color midweek e-paper edition. In addition to the weekend edition, affordable monthly, quarterly, biannual, and annual e-subscription plans. Book, submit, and pay for advertisements online. Go to www.searchlight.vc for more details. Searchlight, journalism you can trust. Now stronger, better, and with more options for everyone. Welcome back in the press room, and we are joined again by Minister of Agriculture, Mr. Uh, Caesar and also the CEO of the MCA, Dr. Thompson. And as we continue, one of the things that you would have shared in 2020, Dr. Thompson, while talking about this industry, you voiced your concern as it relates to the backyard planting and, and so forth. And you were actually, you shared a lot of concern about that um, saying that it can be a hindrance to the industry. Uh, what what has been your findings, and um, what is exact what exactly is your concern about that? Besides, of course, the legal standpoint that Minister Caesar would have been speaking about that we have to tread the waters as it relates to the legality. But what has been your concerns as it relates to that? But two things, really. Um, a country that is developing what I would consider as an export-oriented um, medicinal cannabis industry um, really wants to fashion um, an industry that is somewhat um, geared on the basis of knowing exactly what you are producing. Um, uh, in terms of medical conditions, there are some medical conditions like epilepsy and Parkinson's and so forth that require a type of cannabis that has in 
a substance called CBD. That's what rarely treats those conditions. Whereas conditions like depression, glaucoma, certain type of arthritis, that can have the higher THC. If somebody has anxiety a condition, you don't want to give them a, a, a cannabis that has THC in it. So persons who are going to treat themselves or they really can find out information and they can do a very good job. And some places in, like Canada have got some aspect of that. But the majority of persons, if they're using cannabis for a certain condition, they could end up taking the wrong type of cannabis for what they're taking. And in general, in terms of medication, there's nothing, maybe nothing wrong with self-medicating. But I prefer as, as a medical doctor to want to make sure that people know exactly what they're taking. And if they have a certain condition, then they should really be taking the right amount. I'm not sure if um, everybody who plants their own, first of all, helps in general in the creation of, of your own industry, or for that matter, that they would go and get the tests done to know exactly what is the content of the cannabis they're producing. I think it's 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 helpful. I mean, uh, you know, you go to a pharmacy, you don't go and like make your own medication. You go to a pharmacy and you know the pharmacist is going to give you something of a certain dosage and it's going to be the correct dose. You hope it's the correct dose. And I think it's in that regard that um, having a well-structured um, um, industry where, thank God, we now have a state-of-the-art laboratory that could actually test product and know exactly what's inside it and also know um, um, what it should be used for is very helpful. I, I imagine, too, that um, in, in certain places, having the cancer in the backyard has uh, led to a lot of really petty things. You know, somebody coming in the, in the dead of the night and helping you to it or other kids being exposed, young kids being exposed to it. And that's one of the things we, we always worried about, um, young kids being exposed to it. So I think at that time in 2020, you may have heard me express some concern that that may not be the best approach that we should take and that we should have a much more structured um, approach that that will be helpful. And this is all besides what is law currently and so on. I think some people may be an advocate to change the law and allow everybody to plant it in their backyards and so forth. Um, I, I think that that may not be the best or may have been the best approach. And I still stand uh, by what I said then. And I think that um, we are, we're certainly moving forward in creating a more modern medicinal cannabis industry. All right. Good. Minister Cesar, coming um, on, piggybacking on that, on that point, you recently had meetings, I, I think, doc, um, with traditional farmers. Yes. Um, to to chart the course of bringing them on board as it relates to the industry. What what would you say were the the major concerns that they highlighted in that in that meeting? And as you answer that, also, you have the whole issue from what Dr. Thompson said as it relates to controlling the environment under which the cannabis is grown and so forth. And the question may be, financially, are these traditional farmers able to come to terms with what is required to meet these requirements? Right. So um, I, I must be very frank with you. If you didn't ask me that as my next question, I was going to raise it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's that important because... It is seen as the elephant in the room in the context of the discussion. And that question is not only a question that is raised here in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. It's the same question in Jamaica. It's the same question in Colombia, in Afghanistan. Anytime there is a situation whereby there is the illicit production of a narcotic and there is the establishment of an industrialized framework whereby the particular commodity is moving away from the illicit stream to mainstream, the question is always going to be, 
So how with the persons who were producing it illegally, how would they be integrated into the new system? St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we have a unique piece of legislation. I've looked at all the laws around the world and we have been highlighted as the only jurisdiction which have, has carved out a particular space in the law itself for the traditional cultivator. So in all transparency and for purposes of accountability, if we are having a discussion about the integration of the traditional cultivator, St. Vincent is the only jurisdiction which whilst drafting the law itself, placed into the text of the law, the term traditional cultivator. When we go to Canada, when we speak to the Colombians, they're saying that they wish that they had drafters and policymakers, like the policymakers in St. Vincent and Grandines, who ensured that their rights, roles, and responsibilities in the industry, that they were placed within the context of the law. That is for starters. No, the rubber is going to hit the road at some point in time. And putting it in the law, in the law books is one thing. The question still boils down. I am from Rosebank. I planted cannabis for 20 years of my life illegally. I made $50,000 per year. Now there is a modern medicinal cannabis industry. There's an, uh, an act. It said that I will pay a minimum fee to enter. I think it's about $100 or $500 to enter. I did that. I have a traditional cultivator's license, but I noticed that there are companies coming in from overseas that are setting up greenhouse parks. They have international markets. I saw on the news last week, the minister of agriculture and the head for MC and some medical doctors on a beach at a consumption lounge owned by someone who was not a traditional cultivator, who was never arrested, who was never dragged into the courtroom on a Monday morning before prosecutor Caesar. And the question I want to ask is, where do I stand? And that was the meat of the discussion. Yeah. How are we going to integrate the traditional cultivator to be an active participant in the modern medicinal wellness industry between 2022 to 2030 and beyond? And I want to state this, and I, I stated it categorically to the traditional cultivators who came to the meeting. Let us not look negatively on the persons who are investing millions in the industry. Because what they're actually doing is to create that framework and to create that tide that is going to lift all ships. So for persons who may look at the international company in a negative sense, I want to take us back, for example, to the banana industry. The Winwood Islands had a very important initiative 60 years ago to establish the banana industry. But it took a man called Van Gies to bring the vessels to move the bananas. Now, the local banana farmer <laughs> could have said back then, well, where is that rich man going? Mm -hmm. I am the man who is who, who laboring up and down in the mountains, and he's just coming to move the bananas, and he's going to get how much X, Y, Z from it. This is an industry that can accommodate all players. And the least antagonism that we have among and between persons who are stakeholders, it is going to augur better for the development of the industry. And I left that meeting with the traditional cultivators with an appreciation that they are not going to be engaged in demagoguery. Basically, saying things because 
it sounds like what people would want to hear. But they appreciated that if there are more international investors in the country who are bringing in millions of dollars to invest, to export cannabis, that it increases the probability that there could be working relationships with these investors. And what we have done as a government, we are actively engaging these investors to ensure that a percentage of the cannabis that they export, that it is grown by the traditional cultivators. Now, Kirby, it's very important. Just, before you continue, just yes. before you continue, Minister, because I, I like I like the trend that you're in. I, I didn't want to cut you, but I just yes. want to just add something else into the pot. Um, a couple of years ago, Dr. William Smith president of this uh, Caribbean Development Bank, he strongly voiced that same concern. And I heard you say that you're making steps. And we want. I, I just want to, for, for those who would wonder, how, um, how firm would be these steps and in the sense of drafting into policy to ensure that the budding industry is not dominated by foreign interests and that these men and women who would have um, done it illegally and, as you said, had to face you in court, which wasn't an easy thing for them, to now really benefit from that. Besides just saying it, uh, is there something, um, is there a time frame, is there a, a draft document that is being prepared? Because um, when he voiced that from his position in this uh, Caribbean Development Bank, it, he really went to tongue on that, that that was one of his major concerns, even while he applauded St. Vincent and the Grenadines and others who are embracing the industry. So, if yes. you can... So yeah. even in the context of the, the law, it's, it said that finances obtained from the industry that would accrue to the government, that a percentage of this must go towards the integration of the traditional cultivator into the cannabis value chain. Okay. So coming out of the discussion, what we concluded, and I, I raised it today at the highest level, is that we have to establish an alternative sustainable livelihoods program within the Ministry of Agriculture, and that has been blessed. And what this will do is that we have to take each traditional cultivator individually on a case-by-case -case basis. And I'll tell you why. There may be a traditional cultivator who grew cannabis from the time he was 21 years old until he was 55. But his mindset is not to grow cannabis anymore. He wants to get into cultivation of commodities like ginger or turmeric, or he wants to get into the fishing industry. We are not saying that everyone who was a traditional cultivator should continue in the cannabis industry. It's your choice. And the monies which we are going to put into the establishment of the Alternative Sustainable Livelihoods Program is these monies would be there for opportunities that traditional cultivators would want to be engaged in and not necessarily cannabis engagements in the medicinal wellness industry. Because at the end of the day, you are a traditional cultivator. By right, you would have accrued a certain expectation and a legitimate expectation as a traditional cultivator, but not necessarily it means that you want to continue in cannabis. So what we are going to do is that we are going to speak to the cultivators. There are some already formed into groups, and I need to say that the majority have expressed that they wish to continue in cannabis. Those who do not wish, we will fully integrate them into the agriculture sector and provide the general assistance that we're providing to farmers and the special assistance will be given to these persons as well. Now, the value chain of cannabis has different 
segments. And in the discussion with the traditional cultivators, some noted that they would like to visit Jamaica to see how traditional cultivators there have utilized, for example, eco lodges, lodges that don't take or cost fifty or sixty thousand dollars or hundred or fifty thousand dollars or millions of dollars to be established. How they have these lodges and to see how we can integrate the medical practitioner into the system so that you can have that indigenous participation without running afoul of the law. And I attended, I visited the, the consumption lounge at the facility recently opened. And Kirby, it was like going to a medical doctor. You had to be screened first. You had to give all your names, your names, your information. Then you had to go to a medical doctor who did, who did a thorough interview. And based on the results of that interview, it's only then, an own, it was only then that you were able to go further. Now, what we are saying is that there are traditional cultivators who have lands. These may be located in areas where you can have an eco lodge. There are medical doctors, I am certain, Dr. Thompson, will be willing to assist and to participate in a program where persons can get their prescriptions and then head to these lodges. Of course, these lodges must be regulated by the Medicinal Cannabis Authority and be licensed by the, Med the Medicinal Cannabis Authority, just like the one that I visited last week. So I think to answer this question in a nutshell, Kirby, the government will not be having an unregulated system. If someone is expecting that it is going to be a free for all, it is not going to be a free for all because we are aware and we are cognizant that in the world, narcotics can be used and they can also be abused. And when I go to bed at night, I want to know that I am participating in bringing something to St. Vincent and the Grenadines, whereby the children of St. Vincent and the Grenadines can have confidence that the policymakers did what definitely is in their best interest. The parents who are listening would love to know that the system is regulated and that if they want any treatment, that a trained medical doctor is the route that they had to take. Also, the mother of a, a teenager who went on the block and had a spliff in the hand and the police came by. That mother would not want the child to go to, to prison or to be arrested or be given a criminal record for one spliff. So basically, where we are today, we have looked at the, the citizenry. We have done consultations, and Dr. Thompson will tell you, during the periods of the consultations, we went to the churches and we made certain promises to the churches. And we told the churches of St. Vincent and the Grenadines that we are going to ensure if you allow us to enter onto this path, that we will not abuse this commodity. We will ensure that it is not abused. We will ensure that it is used for scientific research and for medicinal purposes. And that is the mandate. And I believe that once we engage investors, local, regional, or international investors, that with the government's commitment to the traditional cultivators, that over the next 24 months, we are going to see the further engagement and integration of traditional cultivators. What is not said, though, is that already there are traditional cultivators who are integrated into the production systems with 
international investors. In fact, many international investors are telling you that the knowledge and the information that they are obtaining from the traditional cultivators of St. Vincent and the Grenadines who are in joint venture relationships with them. <clears throat> that it is better than persons who are coming from Canada and England who said that they're trained in universities. You won't see that. Another thing you won't see, Kirby, is that there's a long list of traditional cultivators who may be intercepted by the police from time to time. And they put before the police their licenses that they obtained from the Medicinal Cannabis Authority. And the police said, thank you very much, sir. You are a legal producer of cannabis. But that won't make the newspaper. What would make the newspaper is my cousin, who I encouraged to get a medicinal cannabis license, to go to speak to the MCA, who I invited one Friday evening to come to a school to hear and to fill out the form to get his license. He did not do that. He went instead, planted cannabis, and uh, is trying to go through Kingston with it in his car and has 500 pounds at the back of the car. The police stops him and asks him the same question that he asks the, the other traditional cultivator who has a license. Do you have a license to do this? No. Uh, that's Babylon system. I, I don't have any license. Then he's arrested. And what some persons are doing, when I speak about the demagoguery, they are trying to highlight that 20% of persons who I love and who I am continuing to encourage to get their licenses. They're highlighting those 20% as the be all and end all of the whole universe of traditional cultivators. But that's not so. And I want to commend the hardworking staff of the Medicinal Cannabis Authority and Dr. Gerald Thompson, the Terrell Mapp, and the others, the inspectorate, for doing what I consider to be the best job. In fact, they are now being sought after by other regional authorities to come and teach us as to what to do. Patience is virtue. Time is of the essence. There's a fierce urgency of now. And we recognize this as policymakers. And we are going to continue to work with the traditional cultivators of St. Vincent and the Grenadines. You have my word on it. To be fully integrated into the production systems. On that note, we're going to take our final break. And when we come back, we're going to dive into another aspect of this discussion and also take your questions. So like, share our YouTube channel and our Facebook page, and we'll be right back in the press room. I'm Shanika John, Chief Health Promotion Officer acting in the Ministry of Health, Wellness and Environment. Since St. Vincent and the Grenadines started administering the COVID-19 vaccines, we've encouraged persons from different age groups, different risk factors to get vaccinated. 
for those persons who have contracted the COVID-19 virus, vaccinated or unvaccinated, the severity and the impact of the virus is significantly different. If you've not yet considered getting the vaccine, I encourage you to do so today. Get vaccinated. Well, welcome back in the press room as we continue to discuss the blossoming uh, cannabis uh, industry. And what I wonder, we in this section, we're going to be taking uh, any quest, uh, some of the questions that our audience may have. And um, I want to do dive in, Dr. Thompson, on the whole concept, the whole issue of our youths. I remember looking back that in 2018, the Minister of Finance, uh, Mr. Gonzalez, um, Carmelo Gonzalez, was voicing his concern and caution as it relates to our youths and uh, marijuana use and the, the mental illness and mental illness and wellness and, and such like. Even though we, we have established that it's medicinal and that's the way that the, the industry is being um, couched, are you concerned that the decriminalization and such like would bring a sense of um, impression to the youths that all is well with marijuana, smoke it, use it. Um, there's no risk attached to it because there's no longer fear factor as it regards using it and the penalties that are attached to it that in your time and, and even as I was growing up, we knew that was attached to it. Are you concerned? Um, Yes, I, I, we, we are concerned. Uh, let me say that just recently, one of our officers, our biotechnologist, Dr. John Cummings, delivered um, a lecture at the community college. And we are looking to roll out talks at schools. And so we've been not only talking to the police, not only talk, we had a good meeting with the DPP's office, all its staff last week, but we're also talking to the youth. Now, there's an unusual thing about cannabis in that um, cannabis is not known to cause death. It is not a gateway drug. We've proven that. Matter of fact, cannabis is being used in other parts of the world to get people off of the harder drugs. But in terms of young persons whose brains are not fully developed, if an individual uses cannabis where the THC is extra high, I'm talking about 25% THC, and the CBD content of that cannabis is very low. It has a potential to, let's call this, trip them off, to trigger them off into some sort of acute psychosis. I've got to tell you this. These are, these are facts. And out at the mental home, we have seen some cases of this. So there is an intensive program. The law is, is shaped in such a way that cannabis is not allowed for persons under the age of 18, and that we have to continue that whole effort. And as said, we've literally spoken to the churches and to other entities that we will continue this program. But there are going to be some young persons who will still use it. We know this. As said, we found that these episodes of acute psychosis tends to occur in persons who are using very high THC levels and those who have a history in their family of some sort of bipolar, schizophrenia, mental disorder. True, that's, that's what happens. Now, we've just almost finished our research protocol of how to go about research, and we're hoping to work with the mental hospital to assess some of these things and do a lot of work in terms of our youth, in terms of their attitudes. But it's something that we should be concerned about. And whereas there are tremendous benefits to all sorts of other individuals, we always have to be mindful that in terms of a 10-year-old, 11-year-old using cannabis, we will have to put that extra effort into trying to 
um, re re restrict them. But in general, cannabis is considered to be relatively safe. Outside of that uh, um, youth aspect, it's considered to be uh, very safe. And uh, I, I, you know, the doctors have been feeling very comfortable about it. And when we do the training of the doctors and the pharmacists, we bring the various issues to the fore, but compared with a lot of other medications, compared with prescription medications used today, pain medications, we are finding that uh, cannabis is substantially even much safer than many of them, but still we have to be very mindful in relation to our youth. And I'm glad you've brought it up. We're gonna continue that program and make sure that we, we address these things carefully. All right, so um, Cheryl uh, Lou asks, in New York and New Jersey, New York and New Jersey have decriminalized weed to the point where it is allowed for recreational and medicinal. Why are they able to do so if the international laws, from what I understand you have said, prevents this? What makes America different to St. Vincent and the Grenadines? Well, let me say the, the United States is, is, as you call it, the United States. So they believe in what they call states' rights. So some states basically um, have only legalized for medicinal purposes. Some have not done anything at all. And there are about 19 that have legalized for recreational purposes. However, at the federal level, it is still illegal. So therefore, their banking, their international travel, all federal aspects is considered to be legal. Somebody cannot move cannabis from New Jersey into Pennsylvania, you know. You can't move from one state to another. So yes, they've gone on it. Now, I could tell you in Singapore, I could give you a list of seven countries where if you are caught with drugs, there's the death penalty. Singapore has suspended it for two years. They've resumed it. And a lot of human rights are telling Singapore, why are you doing this? But there are lots of countries in the world that haven't even started the process. So St. Vincent de Grenadines may not be like Canada and Uruguay, where we have legalized recreationally, and they are really outliers. We are still progressive and at the forefront of what's been done I mean, when minister was talking about the involvement of the traditional cultivators, they get a license that is free. They only pay a hundred dollars application fee, you know. And do you know, out at the, a lot of the the medicinal cannabis on the market right now, hair and semis and grandees was actually produced by local and traditional cultivators that was purchased and so and um, you know they have they have as he said have been integrated i wanted just to pop that back in that whole integration point but you are absolutely right um united states may be a, a special case at the federal level it is still very very much illegal such that those companies that were u.s based that wanted to invest here in saint vincent Many of them have not been able to proceed because they cannot transfer monies and so forth to St. Vincent in order to set up their business. Uh, Kojo Mason asks, can someone coming from uh, a legalized country and have their medicinal uh, cannabis and it is within the and it is within the two ounces limit, legal limit, what can what would happen to them? I, I could answer the question, Gerald. Yeah. Um, now, the first thing that I want Koju to appreciate is that the country that has it legal and St. Vincent and the Grenadines are two separate countries. And the movement of narcotics from one country to the next, there is a procedure to have that done. And the in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, we have what is issued by the Medicinal Cannabis Authority as an import license. And if you're moving cannabis from another country, there's, an, there's a need for an export license, and we will have the import license. But in, in practical terms, the, what's missing from the question that Ed Kojo has asked is, where actually were you intercepted by the police? 
So if you're intercepted on the streets of St. Vincent and Grenadines with the two ounces, then that's an issue coming, Gerald, within the framework of the tolerance. Yeah. And uh, if you're intercepted at the airport, I am certain that the treatment will be different because then you are basically at the border and it will be treated as an immediate contravention of the, the jurisdiction. But if you met, if you you are found uh, intercepted on the streets, that's a, that's a different thing. So what if I say, if that person is coming from New York, whilst they're in New York, they're okay. But once they hit the airport, they're now in the federal sphere. So the previous question, they are going to be held for for contravention of the federal illegality of cannabis in the United States. And they will be arrested at the airport. Uh, um, at at New at whether whatever airport they live in Miami or whatever the case may be because the, it is illegal federally. Um, but I want to say that if that individual has a prescription or an ID card, they could come down to Saint Vincent and they can fill it without any problems, or they can call a doctor and be interviewed even online. We allow for online interviews, and they could arrive. And they can pick up their cannabis that same evening, and there will be no problem. Okay, uh, Minister Caesar Preston Johnson wants to know: Does the prescribing doctor has the have the medical records of the person they will be prescribing the drugs to? How do they know of any underlying problems a person may have? And I think I can add that they may not have disclosed. Yes, so Dr. Thompson. That's yes, <laughs> we, we go through this all the time. And as an experienced doctor, we ask patients a series of questions. You sometimes meet patients on emergency. There's no medical record around. Um, you do, it's only in a hospital you may well have a medical record if the person has come to your office before. If a patient comes into your office for the first time, there's no medical record. The point I'm making is that as doctors, we have a higher sense of when somebody is trying to just do something for the sake of doing it. And making a diagnosis, that patient could have a certain condition, but it may not be one of the 20 conditions that are allowed, which are epilepsy and neurological conditions or chronic pain or glaucoma or, 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 or depression or anxiety. But in general, um, doctors are experienced in this particular way. And um, that's why today, during this pandemic, more patients have been seen online than have been seen face to face because of the pandemic. And so doctors have gained the experience of being able to, even though they may not be able to physically examine a the patient, they'll be able to sus suss out exactly what is really wrong with the patient. If something is wrong with the patient, if something is seriously wrong with the patient, and they'll have a high sense of awareness if some if a patient is just trying to scam them. But at the same time, um, uh, we're able to get around these things because you know we experience with this. Uh, we, we take a couple more. Uh, Carl Nash wants to know, is marijuana still considered a class one drug based on the new, the new laws? Unfortunately, I, I wanted to hold up. This is called the single convention. And it's one of my great disappointments. Kirby, two years ago, the United Nations held a conference. And I thought they were going to move it from a class one drug to a class two or class three. By a narrow defeat of 27 to 24, they kept it in class one. But something remarkable happened. For the first time since that 1961 convention treaty was passed, they finally recognized that cannabis has huge medicinal properties. In other words, the Rastafari were right when they were telling us this all the time. And they have now sanctioned a lot of research. They've said, go ahead with all the research, but still, it may take some more years before they move it from that class one status. So because it's in class one, it still has all the restrictions, all the tightness in other countries. It still means in Singapore, they could put you to death. 
And it's really unfortunate that that has not changed. So um, that international aspect is still in place and St. Vincent cannot change that on its own. We can't reschedule. It has to be rescheduled internationally by the International Narcotics Control Board, and it hasn't been. All right. Miss Crystal, just a couple. Miss Crystal Kimberly Oliver wants to know, is there a new policy regarding CBD? Yes. Let me tell you, I'm astonished, too, that there is CBD that is also made from something called hemp. It's a form of cannabis that doesn't have in any THC that gets you high. And the CBT is, is a very important um, you know, component of treatments and so forth. Do you know, we've actually done a lot of assessments and a whole set of stuff is coming in in barrels and so forth. People are, are, are bringing the CBD. But the CBD is coming in the form of creams and ointments and so forth. And we are saying that, look, we shouldn't really do any kind of major restriction of those things so that we're not going to go around doing a whole set of policing of CBD creams and CBD ointments and CBD odorizers and so forth. And so in terms of our regulations, we haven't legalized CBD. We've just, in terms of um, um, the, the whole tight regulations and so forth, we, we, we are not really doing. And according to the International Narcotic Control Board, they should be issuing some better directives on this in the upcoming months. But we basically are not uh, making a big, big deal out of major CBD um, products and so in this regard. Right. I think as we, we, we are uh, nearing the, the close, any final thoughts? And before I get your final thoughts, uh, Dr. Thompson, um, Minister Cease, I want to ask you uh, a, 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 a question from a different lane. Um, you mentioned a couple of times of your previous career as a prosecutor. And I know you would have known that there would have been young people whose opportunities may have been derailed because of convictions for marijuana and, and so forth before these changes. Um, any thoughts? Any thought being um, going around from a governmental standpoint to help remove some of these stigmas as it relates to persons who might have run afoul a of the law? And even for you as a prosecutor, now being in government, is that something that you're passionate about? Yes. Well, well definitely, when you, when you assess the, the circumstances which are before us, there, there are several persons who were arrested, charged, and have criminal records for very small quantities. And we have a Rehabilitation of Offenders Act in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And I am aware that several persons have already come forward. And the, the cleaning of records, that that is already taking, taking place in the country. What complicates it sometimes, though, Curry? that some persons were found with cannabis with rounds of ammunition and guns. Yeah. So it's it's not a, as clear cut sometimes as as it seems. But for persons who are arrested with small quantities, definitely it is in line with the evolving and emerging customary international law on the subject matter. Coming out from the practice which is advocated by the international Narcotics Control Board, that these persons should really not be locked out from the society and that they should actually be integrated. And in fact, we have a system within the government where persons who are in need of counseling, that this sort of platform could be created and exposed to persons who are desirous but again, as I said earlier, 20 years ago, the circumstances globally, I could still remember you walking in there into the courtroom. I have in my, my, my blue book in my hand. And <laughs> you see, and I, I could never forget that. Jiggy, jiggy. Jiggy, jiggy was a big thing <laughs> every weekend. And a lot of youngsters would go there. And not only jiggy, jiggy, but the emergence of Heritage Square 
mm-hmm. as a place where you would have young persons congregation. Yeah. congregating on a Friday. Mm-hmm. On Monday, the courtroom was filled with young persons. And I remember the, the magistrate, I think it was Sherman, the chief magistrate at the time, saying to me as a prosecutor, you need to make a public statement that the parents must advise their children to, to not participate in these things because some police officers had a field day. And, and I'm really happy that we, we have come a very, very long way from, from those days. Any final thoughts, gentlemen, as we wrap up tonight? Well, well, since I'm at it, Gerald, I could give my final thoughts. Yes, yes, yes. What, what I really want from citizens, and I say citizens because the cannabis value chain is very extensive, and cannabis is only one of the commodities that we have explored thus far. There are many other commodities that have narcotic properties that we will be exploring as a part of the medicinal wellness platform in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. I want persons to be very rational in our assessment of the industry. I don't want persons to, to get on high horses for political reasons or try to create a a discussion or an argument just for arguing sake. But let us look at the reality which is before us. It is a globally competitive industry. Therefore, it means that we must produce products of a very high standard. We have to respect the rights of everyone. We also have to remember and appreciate that the law was drafted after a series of consultations with various bodies. And the embodiment that we see in that text came out from the expression of a political will, where the churches had a say, the teachers had a say, the doctors had a say, the Rastafari community had a say, and the traditional cultivators had a say. And what we have in St. Vincent and the Grenadines is still a, an industry which is emerging, still in its embryonic stages. We have been able to mobilize the factors of production. Persons have found lands to plant on. They have brought the technology. There's a lot of capital investment taking place. And persons are being trained as workers. I think that we need to highlight more of the positives and we also need to address some of the, the negatives which are coming out and emerging from the challenges which quite naturally will find its way in a conversation where we are moving any commodity that was once illicit to one that is illicit. And Kirby, my final note is this. If anyone was of the view that there will be a seamless transition there won't be any argument. There won't be any hurt feelings in moving from illicit cannabis to a modern medicinal wellness industry. That person is definitely wrong. But what I think we can both agree on is that as rational participants in the debate, we can find solutions together. Thank you very much. Dr. Thompson, your final yes. thoughts? I, I want to say that um, within our laws, which I think has been very progressive, the laws and the regulations, we can see medicinal cannabis being used in hospitals and in clinic settings. We can see wellness centers being set up and their structures of how a wellness center will be set up. We can see dispensaries and next to them can be consumption lounges, you know? And we have the provision for which visitors, whether you're coming from England, Canada, New York, can come to St. Vincent and have relatively easy access, whether you come with your ID card or you're able to see a physician and have access to medicinal cannabis. 
I am very proud of the fact that most of the product that's now available on the ground, traditional cultivators and local co have contributed to that. And very shortly, you're going to see us distribute over 200 acres of land down in the Richmond area and some other lands in elsewhere so that traditional cultivators can have a piece of land that is legally leased to them so that they could truly become part of this industry and whole systems are going to be put in place and along with what um, the minister has been saying about how else we are going to um, um, ensure that traditional cultivators are part of this process. Um, I want to give you my assurance that the MCA, which is a regulator, is going to do um, um, everything then that it can in turn within the confines of the law to make sure that they are truly um, continue to be a part of this industry and this industry grows so that we are internationally recognized as being a player in this global market. Well, thank you so very much, Dr. Thompson and the Honorable Sabota Caesar for joining us in the press room where we were discussing the emerging uh, medicinal cannabis industry in St. Vincent and the Grenadines. And we thank you for joining us in the press room. So until next time, I'm your host, Kirby Jackson, saying good night. Okay. Okay.